Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. With me all the way from Berkeley in California, I have with me Professor Pranob Kumar Bortham. He recently retired as Professor of Economics at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, and uh, Professor Bortham was educated at Presidency College in Kolkata and then at the Cambridge University in England. And he served on the faculty of various educational institutions, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the Indian Statistical Institute, the Delhi School of Economics, among others. And, and, and he's uh, author of uh, 16 books. He's edited 14 volumes, numerous essays and articles in the media. And, and in the first part of our discussion, we, we, we looked at Bengal politics. And in this part of our discussion, we're going to look at the Indian economy, specifically looking at inequality in India. We're going to look at crony capitalism and oligarchy in India. And we're going to look at, among other things, the labor laws that, which the uh, current government wants to uh, change and, and, and revamp completely. So thank you once again, Professor Bordon, for giving the viewers of NewsClick your valuable time. I was listening to this lecture where, which you had delivered at the uh, Washington University recently, where you touched on various issues relating to how to save Indian capitalism from the capitalists. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the issues that you flagged in that talk. And one of them is the issue of inequality. There have been several studies that in recent years, the inequality, inequalities of income, wealth, and ownership of capital, that is, have widened in India. According to one report, the World Inequality Report, the top 1% of India's population holds 30% of the total wealth of the country, while the bottom half, the bottom 50% of the population own barely 6% of the total wealth. And, and we know that uh, these, there are many other studies, Oxfam has made a study, others have made a study, but all of them have shown that India's, which was already a very unequal country, very, very unequal country, has become even more unequal, especially in the last Recent past, uh, the anecdotal evidence also indicates that uh, post COVID, post lockdown. And Professor Bordon, what are the economic, social, and political implications of the widening of inequalities of income and wealth in India? Yes, thank you, Paranjaya. Uh, I think many people in India, including many economists, are not aware, are not fully con conscious that India, for a long time, not just in the last uh, eight years, uh, for a long time has been one of the most unequal countries in the world. Uh, this, um, by the way, this... Um, uh, the inequality from the world inequality report that you uh, that you indicated it's actually not um, not um, uh, the latest data but uh, the uh, it, usually in india first of all india data wise is a problem on inequality because india does not collect officially does not collect income data so you cannot get income distribution it only India does consumption data. Yes. Um, India does collect wealth data. And this World Inequality Report has taken the India, it's not their data, it's the Indian National Sample Survey data. Um, now, which tells us that Indian inequality of wealth has now reached the Latin American range. Latin America is one of the world's most unequal. And Indian wealth inequality has now reached there. I mean, I mean, we are today on par with South Africa as well. And, and the United States where you live. U United States is, in fact, not as unequal as Latin America and South Africa. 
South Africa and, and many parts of Latin America like Brazil, uh, Argentina, Mexico, um, Chile, these are more unequal than, than, than United States. And India is reaching the Latin American range in, in, in uh, wealth inequality. But let me add something to that, which will tell you the inequality is actually is even higher than that. It's because these data, as I told you, the, the, the World Inequality Report got it from National Sample Survey. These are National Sample Survey data is from household survey. They go, they go to a household and ask them about their wealth. Now, household surveys always underestimates wealth inequality. Why? Because various reasons. One is that, is that one major reason, I could give you five other reasons, but one major reason is that people's wealth takes different forms. Some wealth is land, some is houses, buildings, some other kinds of real estate, and some in jewelry, and some in financial wealth, investment in stock markets. Now, land and buildings, you can't really hide that much. But financial wealth, people underreport. And since the rich have the more financial wealth, is there is tremendous underreporting. And that's not just true in India, everywhere, household service underreport wealth inequality. So even the data that you mentioned is an understatement of inequality. More than that, this data about physical wealth, I already gave you the example, land, buildings, uh, real estate in general, uh, jewelry and financial. It does not count a very important part of our wealth, which you and I have, and many others have, is what economists call human capital. We carry in our brain human capital because we have been educated. So education gives you some kind of human capital. And it turns out, we have data on this now, it turns out in educational capital, India's inequality, educational wealth, I'll tell you in a minute how are them crudely measure it, but in educational wealth, Indian inequality is even worse than Latin America. Because Latin America, even the common people have more education than Indian common people. So how do they measure it? They go to a household and ask people about how many years of schooling you had as an adult. And every adult, they ask the question, not the children, but the adults, they ask the question, how many years of schooling you had? So then they may make, a, uh, make, a, make, make a measure of inequality. And that measure, India is one of the worst in the world, much worse than Latin America. So if you take all kinds of wealth, including educational wealth, in my judgment, India is one of the most unequal countries in the world. All right. Then so what we find, uh, Professor Bordon, I'm interrupting you, is that over the years, several policy initiatives or several taxation measures that may have contained or, or at least ensured that this country didn't become more unequal have been done away with. Recently, we did away with the wealth tax on the ground that the government was not getting enough collection. So what's the use having a tax where your cost of collection is uh, perhaps higher than what you're collecting or the, it's a negligible amount you are actually gathering. Earlier, much earlier, I think, if I'm not mistaken, about 40 years ago, we had done away, 40 or maybe even longer, I, I forget when we did away with the inheritance tax. But the point is, whenever such initiatives are talked about, the government uh, says, no, what's the use of having these taxes because we're not able to collect anything. What are your views? My views, I've studied that question. By the way, inheritance tax was, uh, uh, was uh, abolished in Indira Gandhi's time, uh, 1982 or 83, around that time. Uh, wealth tax was done more recently, 2015. The, for example, the wealth tax and earlier inheritance, but I have studied the wealth tax issue. Why wasn't the wealth tax generating revenue? Because if you study the law, it exempts most kinds of wealth. In fact, if some, some wealth you can show 
it has a productive use that is not taxed. So you can always show that this, this land, this building is coming to productive use. So it's not counted. So in general, the way what they do is they put so many loopholes, loopholes. It's not a surprise that it does not take, uh, uh, it does not gather so much revenue. Uh, and this, by the way, is a problem all over the world. So now, they are, since they are seriously considering, they probably ultimately will not because of the Republicans uh, in the United States. Uh, the United States is seriously discussing issues of wealth tax. And these issues are coming up there as well. The loopholes in wealth measurement and so on. But let me now come to, I was all along talking about individual or household wealth. But a large part of wealth is corporate wealth. And I think it's very important to understand the corporate wealth. By the way, in just before the COVID hit us uh, in 2019, 2019 September, uh, in order to stimulate the economy, uh, finance minister uh, reduced drastically the tax on corporate corporation tax. Uh, so, and, and with that, just one stroke of pen, uh, she, uh, what, what was the total amount of gift she gave to the comp companies? It, about one lakh crore. About one lakh crores was literally gifted to the large corporates. They were hoping they will then invest it. Now, today we know they didn't invest it because the, the, the constraint in the economy, demand constraint, is not because you know, people don't have the money to invest. So that was a completely wrong policy to do. But anyway, that was done. What I wanted to emphasize is how concentrated corporate capital is. So let me cite one piece of statistics to you. It has been estimated that 20 most profitable farms in India generated in 1990, 14% of total corporate profits. In 2010, 30%. In 2019, the 20 most profitable farms generated 70% of all corporate profits. So over time, it shows the concentration of capital. And most evidence suggests that these profits are not due to innovations or large productivity rise, but mainly due to market power. Because of the monopoly power increasing, profits went up. It is because of this corporate concentration and inequality, why you see such a large disjuncture today between our stock market, which is booming, and hundreds of millions of people and, and they pushed into destitution. Mess. In fact, even the government's exactly. own data shows that in the first half and the period between April, the first six months, India was what we say technical recession. For the first time in the history of well, <laughs> the GDP came down in two successive quarters. And not merely that, I would say this, um, the, uh, the decline in the economy has been going on since 2016, at least since that, uh, that uh, extremely stupid and highly damaging measure of demonetization. But not just that, but in general, the economy has been on decline. And then of course, COVID hit and lockdown. Again, unnecessarily uh, stringent lockdown in the beginning. And then mismanaging the, um, the COVID uh, that, uh, that uh, made the reason why recent second wave uh, made so much splash because now the middle class, the earlier image was about uh, uh, migrant workers, but this time it hit even middle class households. But anyway, the economy has been declining for quite some time, sharp decline uh, during uh, the lockdown, COVID and lockdown. But what I wanted to mention, why is it such a great disjuncture between booming stock market and hundreds of millions of people uh, pushed into destitution and misery is disjuncture because the stock market doesn't care for other people. It's because this, uh, this small number of people, the corporate concentrated capital 
is having enormous amount of profits. The other point to note here, I told you, uh, gave you the figures uh, for 1990, 2010, and 2019. I think it's, there's an important distinction between if from 1990, the so-called liberalization, since then, and if you take the 30 years, if you divide it into two parts, 1990 to 2010, and then 2010 to until today, if you divide it into two parts, there's a big difference. And I think this difference is very important to see how the Indian capitalism is changing. If you take 1990 to 2010, you could see in this period, there was a rise of regional capital, particularly in South and West of India. And there was also quite a bit of competition among the new business groups. So between 1990 and 2010, a lot of new business groups came up, which were not there earlier, okay? And politically, this coincided with the rise of powerful regional political parties. If you remember the 1990 to 2010, regional political parties had an assertive role in national political coalitions. What happened today in the next 2010 to 2020, particularly since 2014, we now see a change. Now we have a single party dominance, regional parties are not that important, and there's centralization of political power under a supreme leader. So the political economy constellation has changed. In fact, uh, the journalist Harish Damodaran has distinguished these two periods, and I think I agree with him. So the, so he says the earlier period was one of entrepreneurial capitalism. In the latter period, he calls it conglomerate capitalism. I didn't fully agree, even in the earlier period, as Paranjaya, you, you have documented this, some of it is rentier capital, this mining mafia and all that. So even in the earlier period, um, the, 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 uh, some of this was not entrepreneurial capital. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it was different forms of predatory capitalism, crony capitalism. Yeah, but now much more conglomerate capitalism and crony that I'm, I'm going to come, come to that now. Um, before that, let me note something else. Over time, this why it's become more like an oligarchy, competition is shrinking. Earlier period, uh, there was a lot more competition among the regional businessmen, business capital. Competition has shrunk. In most sectors, there are only two or at most three players together having more than 50% market share. And this you can see in the sectors like telecom, airlines, steel, cement, aluminium, paints, synthetic fibers, cars, trucks, tires, consumer electronics, and so on. If you count each of these sectors, there are only two at most three players together having more than 50% market share. So this is what I call uh, oligarchic capitalism. Now, the part of it, it's oligarchy, but it is a crony oligarchy because favors and special regulatory dispensations are available for only a select small number of large crony businesses. And in some cases, the rules and goalposts were changed midstream to help the cronies. And I'll give you three or four examples. Story of the airport acquisition by one business house is now well known. This is a business house which did not own any airports, but within a few months became the largest owner of airports. First came six airports, smaller airports. Even there, Ministry of Civil Aviation had to change the rules. That's what I mean, changing the rules and goalposts had to change the rules because it had the, one of the conditions was that whoever owns these airports should have some experience in running them. But this particular business house did not have any experience. So they made an exception. 
and, and another rule was that the same business group could not have more than one airport. If you remember when the, the right. uh, I think there is more than two two airports. I think two yes, two airports something, but these were smaller airports. This business house had in their sight the big prize, which was Mumbai, Mumbai International Airport. There, there was an obstacle because already GVK owned much of the Mumbai airport. So somehow they that were actually the operators, they, they were the operator. They were the operators. And, and then, so that had to, that obstacle, this is an obstacle. You know how that obstacle was, was removed. Um, now, you say the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. And I, I, I remember that week when Mumbai Airport was acquired by the, the business house, GVK yielded. That beginning of the week, because I read Indi many Indian newspapers every day, in one business newspaper I read, Ministry of Finance quietly said some investigations against GVK are being started. Some, some old problem, but they started that week. And GVK took the hint, so they yielded. So this is an example of rules and goalpost chains. Another case of, of a business house has a coal-based power plant in Jharkhand was suddenly declared a special economic zone in 2019 to get tax benefits. Then you know about Reliance Geo in telecom. A lot of other rivals of Reliance Geo in the beginning were complaining about what they called, what in economics is called predatory pricing. You make the power price artificially low and that way you kill the competition, okay? Except, sir, that both the Competition Commission of India as well as the Telecom Regulatory of, uh, Authority of India. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Or what is market <laughs> concentration? What is uh, a dominant... Uh, uh, That's what I'm going to say. Uh, all of the, that were tweaked. When those complaints came up, TRAI, the regulatory authority that you're talking about, hastily amended the previous rules and changed the definition of quote unquote significant market power. Also, been many stories. Um, a, a, a journalist named Nitin Shetty, I don't know if you know him. Nitin Shetty, Nitin yeah. Shetty has done many investigative reports on how pre existing environment regulations have been bent to accommodate uh, the uh, conglomerate. In fact, uh, there's been a lot, there's been a big hue and cry in the manner in which the EIA, the, env uh, the environment impact assessments are taking place. Right. You, are, you have claimed that democracy is dying in India. You have claimed that the capitalists of India have colluded in this project. You are being, it's not just a systematic hollowing out of in, in institutions, but a tearing apart of the social fabric. Uh, this is what you have said. Now, what we see, this process has been facilitated by not just ineffective and supine regulatory authorities, but the way the banking system, the public sector banks have written off loans that, and, and that's, that's the next thing, sir, is the whole insolvency process we are seeing so, so next next point my haircuts, point was called haircuts that are taking place <laughs> my next point is exactly on that issue can i can i now <laughs> go into that i think well not to speak of the earlier the top 50 willful defaulters there are now estimates how much they have robbed the public sector banks. Uh, some say it's about one, uh, one lakh crores, et cetera. No, no, much more than that, sir. The, it the should be much more. Estimates vary from one trillion, to almost one trillion dollars, seven lakh crore to 10 lakh crores. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of estimates. Right. So I, I don't want to go into the estimate. Let me just say on this insolvency and bankruptcy code, which a lot of people, a lot of economists were very much uh, uh, optimistic about. But when there's this corrupt nexus of public sector bankers, businessmen, 
and politicians, as long as that nexus remains, these changes are not going to make much difference. Already, the government has undermined this insolvency and bankruptcy code to preserve its discretion in regulatory forbearance for promoters. And let me give you two quotes that I read this week in, again, in business newspapers. I don't, I don't, have, I don't follow Twitter, but this is a quote from a Twitter sent by the well-known businessman, Harsh Gwenka. Uh, he's essentially saying how the insolvency and bankruptcy code is being gained by these crony oligarchies. And I'm quoting the Twitter. It says, promoters stash away money on the side, take the company to the cleaners, get 80 to 90% haircut from bankers. Haircut, if you don't know about uh, these things, your uh, audience doesn't know it. It Some is of the you... amount of money that banks agree to forego of the total exactly. due. You don't have to return. return. 80 to 90% of the bank loan, you don't have to repay. Bank loan and interest. 80 to 90% haircut for banks. And, and banks and NCLT, which is national uh, company, company law. Yeah. And, and then Hush Goenka adds, that is the new game in town. And let me now read from another statement this week by NCLT, the National Company um, uh, Tax, uh, uh, National uh, Company Law Tribunal. So even NCLT this week expressed, uh, this week or last week, expressed their uh, surprise. And they, given, they give several examples. Let me just quote one example. They said, they were surprised that Vedanta's Anil Agarwal was paying about nothing to take over Videocon Industries. Videocon group of companies, yes sir. NCLT is expressing surprise that they're getting it free. Now, you might remember the Urjit Patel, whom I know, who used to be the Reserve Bank governor, and the issue on which he resigned, or at least implicitly, that now it's explicit from his book that he has written since then, he resigned on this issue of undermining the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So this is again an example of how this is being used uh, to essentially undermine any institution uh, that um, causes problems for gaming the system. More recently, a trial balloon has been floated I know. I, I think what you're talking about, Professor Bordon, is the paper that was floated by the Reserve Bank of India suggesting that large corporates be allowed to take over banks. Are you talking right. about that? Exactly. Exactly. And of course, they said if, they, if there's any hunky panky, the regulators will look after that. But with our regulatory bodies, which essentially quite often are just uh, bodies to give um, a plush retirement job, post-retirement jobs for our bureaucrats. You don't expect, it's not very credible there if, if there is any uh, politically connected lending to crony oligarchs, uh, that uh, and the regulatory body is going to stop it, uh, it's not credible. Already, and I don't know how many people know this, already the business family of the Hindujas have a significant stake in the bank called Ind. Uh, Indus, Indus, in, Indus in. the, the Kotak group also has uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a bank, a Kotak Mahindra Bank. Yes, please. Kotak's uh, family. Yes. In 2017, the government allowed the State Bank of India to have a joint venture with Ambani's Geo Payments Bank. The former State Bank of India chairperson who closed the do deal soon after her retirement the following year joined the Board of Reliance Industries as a non-executive director. You're talking about Mrs. Arundhuti Bhattacharjee, 
and and but she went through what is called a cooling period, a cooling off period. Oh, oh, I think it's one uh, one year or something. That's correct. And and uh, me and a colleague of mine, Abhir Dasgupta, we've actually uh, analyzed this uh, problem and described it as the, the camel in the tent, the the famous analogy right. of the camel in the tent. I mean, why should India's biggest bank have a tie up with a payments bank which is not even in its infancy? It's virtually uh, it's about to be bought, right. kind of thing. Right. Now let's see the other side of the process. This is all how crony business is helped by the government. But it's not one way. This business then helps the government. Let so me I guess want to come what you're going to say. Let me guess what you're going to say. You're going to talk about the electoral bonds, the opaque right. bonds, which you described as a con game. You've used very strong language. So I mean. Through electoral bonds, the quid pro quo works. Am I correct? Yes, I, I think so. But it's very difficult to prove the quid pro quo. One side and the State Bank of India knows. <laughs> State Bank of India knows, and and in fact, through State of Bank of India, the the government knows who has paid and who has not paid. And 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 today, if you know, there's enough evidence to say how the sections within the Ministry of Finance, sections within the Reserve Bank of India, had all opposed this whole electoral bond scheme, but the government just pushed it through. Yes, and when Arun Jaitley introduced his this um, act in uh, bill in 2017, he called it electoral reform. I mean, what can be? This is the most ridiculous, and that's why I'm calling it. It's an ingenious con game. and uh, of course you cannot directly prove how much of these bonds have gone to the ruling party but from most accounts that i have seen um, the the amount that going to the ruling party is many times what has gone to the other parties combined there's no doubt is it that the, the, we already have evidence that well over 90% the, well over 90% right. of these electoral bonds as per the official returns of the political parties given to the election commission of india have gone to one recipient and that is the bharatiya janata party right and and the beauty of it such bonds are tax deductible so in a way the tax payers are also contributing to the ruling party because it's it's tax deductible uh so you you are subsidizing the tax payers are subsidizing these electoral bonds okay so you know i i want to just uh, just move on a little bit from here but what do you see and i'm linking this with the earlier uh, point that you made about the concentration of wealth in india uh, uh, mr mukesh ambani uh, who was in 2020 2014 the 40th richest man in the world is supposed to be today the fourth richest man in the world and this is all thanks to right. market capitalization going up and the stock market is booming exactly and we see the uh, and the other thing as a result what this people this favored business houses even when they are heavily debt strapped have very little difficulty in raising domestic or foreign money in fact Why? mr uh, mukesh ambani geo platforms has raised money from facebook from microsoft from google from you name it from qualcom so these from, these foreign companies know which side of the bread is buttered so the these business favored business houses enjoy a kind of implicit sovereign guarantee both in raising finance and in navigating the murky waters of regulatory approvals okay uh, and uh, yes go ahead uh, you want to ask me something yeah, yeah, yeah. please complete yourself i have one last point on on one last issue i want you to discuss and given the paucity of time you know uh, pl please conclude uh, what you were saying on this whole issue of the crony the uh, only thing uh, i i want to tell you that what this quid quid pro quo the my electoral bond etc so no longer does the ruling party need as the regional parties earlier did remember the earlier period of regional parties were important the regional parties they needed money too but they raised money from an odd assortment of smaller fish one liquor baron here one sugar baron there one real, local real estate tycoon here pwd contractors there 
Now, big national capital funnels ample money to the big national party and is suitably rewarded in a crony capitalist oligarchic system. Now, the more, um, the one thing that I wanted to mention, even if you say we don't care, as long as economy does well as a result. But the economy is not doing well. The economy is in a The economy not merely uh, is not doing well. People, of course, would blame the COVID, but even independently of COVID or anything, crony oligarchy may be good for short-run profits for some select group of capitalists, but not for a healthy development of capitalism. Okay. If I the rise in ine- nor is the rise in inequality can do much for capitalism in the long run because it exacerbates demand deficiency. Oh. Because ma- for them, demand is for the masses of people and they don't have money, so d- the, the, then capitalism cannot thrive. And not to speak of en- um, the brazen dilution of environmental regulation that poisons and uproots community life and hearts long run development. Okay. So let me say you have a question. Yes. You know, this whole thing, what you say, and uh, I was listening to your talk uh, at the Washington University. He's, if, he, you argue that if India's capitalists were more prudent, they would have lobbied for a higher health budget. India spends exactly. a minuscule amount of its uh, you know, uh, t- total budget. Uh, for In, India's health, bu- health, part, uh, GDP, the- health expenditure, GDP ratio is yeah. not just lower than um, uh, the, the rich countries, it's lower than most poor countries. In fact, correct, even correct. some, forget about China, forget about Vietnam. Yeah, so, Vietnam so, spends the, much uh, yeah, as the, India. But the corporate sector is not lobbying for such a higher health budget. It, yes. it is not lobbying. That's what my point is. You know, uh, you know, reduction in inequality, uh, greater uh, entitlement of workers to these kinds of benefits, to have a better education system, including at the at the primary level. So you are saying that this shows the myopic nature of India's capitalism. That that exactly. they don't realize that having a terrible healthcare system, a, a very bad education system. With growing inequalities is bad for the corporate sector, its own profitability. Its That's own why the title of my talk, the title of my talk in George Washington University, saving capitalism in India from India's capitalists, because India's capitalists are so myopic, is actually not going to save capitalism because it's going to ultimately hurt them. Just, just imagine um, the and this is a problem that the United States also faces because they have also a horrible health uh, public health system. Uh, but so when United States capitalists compete with say a capitalist even say neighboring country Canada, Canada has a much better public health system. So when United States capitalists are competing with countries in Scandinavian countries uh, or, uh, or Canada they are hurting themselves because first of all, health expenditure uh, um, uh, improves worker productivity. So your own workers will be more productive uh, if your workers have health care. Secondly, um, whatever health in the United States, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is less true in India, is the private health insurance, which in India, is also they're going India is also going for pri- primarily for, which is a model I think they should go for universal health insurance and my point is not a leftist point of view my point it hurts the capitalist's own interest so, so we are Cap- not even getting into whether capitalism is good or capitalism is bad <laughs> exactly we were just talking that this is bad for capitalism itself and therefore yeah. the position adopted by uh, our business class is rather short-sighted. Uh, right. Professor Gordon, you know, uh, I want to ask you a, a last, uh, I mean, this is the last theme on which I'd like you to talk a little bit about. The government is talk, has is changing the rules pertaining to labor, benefits to workers. And these are workers largely in the organized sector. And then, you know, we know that 90% of India's working class is in the informal or unorganized sector. Right. But, 
And I quote you here, egged on by myopic business and their media supporters, the government's labor protect, I mean, instead of protecting labor, uh, uh, it's done exactly the opposite. It has created more distrust, more unrest among laborers, and stagnation in worker productivity. Please elaborate and explain why you have made these comments. In fact, <laughs> since I gave that lecture in George Washington University, I think within a month, something happened, which is an example of this. And this ha thing happened near Bangalore. Uh, I'm, try I'm trying to remember the name of that factory where iPhones are produced. And this is, uh, uh, it's an Apple subsidiary. Um, it's an associate of Apple. That's correct. As associate it's Apple. I think it's a large number of workers. What happened? They're not just retrenched. They, first of all, don't allow any unions. Okay. Then they arbitrarily change rules, like suddenly they change the eight hour day work into a 12 hour day. Then they also change rules about night hours for women's work because women's safety issues that they should, they, they, labor laws usually restrict. Um, women, uh, women's hours at night. They also ignored that. So as a result, what happened, this caused so much distrust and unrest. Then the workers became violent and started um, damaging uh, property. And now um, this uh, company, I think it's a uh, Apple subsidiary is a Taiwanese company. I think it's Foxconn, if I remember right. Uh, the, in this near Bangalore, uh, I think the name of the factory in Bangalore is Wiscon or, uh, or some such name. You can check it. Um, so they have now admitted their mistake, but they can go ahead, do, they can go get away with doing this. I mean, they recognize their mistake after the outburst of workers. Now you can e expect workers to become this kind of, these things don't come suddenly. I mean, th th these things don't come in overnight. Long period of exploitation, oppression, and unjust labor laws ultimately uh, burst forth. Uh, just as, for example, in the earlier, in Haryana Manesar, uh, the, in the Maruti factory, there was also an outburst of that kind. Now, some of these labor laws were not bad, but what, what they have done in this new labor code which by the way, was passed through parliament without any discussion. So that no, any just points like, to- Just like the farm laws, the new farm, farm laws, laws. Many, many other laws. They still uh, wrong with Because the government, government does not believe in discussion. And for your information, so, you new information technology rules. There were no parliamentary- over Right, discussion. no parliamentary discussion. So in fact, the farm laws case shows that, you know, sometimes people rebel. Uh, when you go on doing that, it's the process. Uh, if, if you did it through a proper process, many changes, you could have done compromise. Uh, so you could have avoided a lot of misery on both sides. Um, so one of the, but one of the new labor codes, uh, labor, uh, new labor code, I think they're called. One of them is that now they're introducing a fixed term contract. But because they don't want everybody to be a permanent worker. And I, I understand that. But this fixed term contract, fixed term is not defined. So whether it's 11 months or whether it's 11 years. It could be five months. It could be five years. So it's entirely up to arbitrary left to the employer. Okay. So the employer will, you know, juggle and, and also there are all kinds of provisions that it is um, the government reserves the right. Oh, the government does not allow these things to be adjudicated by the courts. So if a worker is not happy with how the employer is, uh, is implementing this labor code, there's nowhere to go to. You cannot complain to anybody. They try to do the same thing with the farm laws. And then they backtrack. Yes, exactly, exactly. The government there is no, yeah. It's again farm laws. For example, 
I support part of them, not all of it. There are a lot of problems in farm laws, but some of it, I, 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 I understand the motivation for this reform, but I object to the process and I object to this kind of no discussion and I object to that there is no recourse to uh, arbitration, tribunal, judicial, no recourse to judiciary. So these are things which make it particularly oh. unfair. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Pranav Bordal, for giving us your views on a wide range of issues from the new labor code to why large sections of the Indian economy in the private sector have become less competitive, leading to crony capitalists, oligarchies getting retrenched. Uh, you also talked about why stock markets are booming while the economy is in pretty bad shape and about the corrupt nexus between bankers capitalists, and of course, the government. Thank you once again for speaking with Newsclick, and thank you. Uh, now the viewers of Newsclick will know that this is the second and uh, the final segment of my conversation with Professor Pranav Bardhan, who recently retired as Professor of Economics at the University of California at Berkeley. Thank you so much for being with us and keep watching Newsclick. Thank you.